Hey everybody, I hope that you are doing well today. This is Stephen with Junior Achievement of North Florida here with another Career Speaker Series interview. Today we have Laura from Atlanta, Georgia. Laura, thanks so much for joining in today. Thanks for having me, happy to be here. Awesome, so the very first step of this interview is just kind of describing yourself, any fun facts or where you're from, personal information that you'd like to share. Cool, uh, my name is Laura DeGroat. I am 28 years old, like you said, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I grew up in Peachtree City, Georgia, which is always kind of a fun fact. Um, everybody basically has a parent that works for Delta, is kind of what we're known for. And then also we all have golf carts. So that's mm -hmm. interesting. We literally, the high schools have golf cart parking lots because people drove their golf carts to school. So that's always wow. kind of fun. And um, like you said, I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I have a fun little corgi. He's great. Yes. And that's kind of me. So uh, the next part of this interview is kind of describing uh, you're in the mindset of high school mm -hmm. and what was your thought process? Like, did you know that you wanted to go to college? Did you want to enter into the workforce or right afterwards? Like, what was your major if you did go to college? Um, kind of explain to these students what was your thought process in those years? Yeah, so me, kind of, it wasn't really an option. I was going to go straight to college. That's just kind of how parents thought that's kind of yeah. how they raised us and so from the beginning of high school I knew I was going to go to college so um I started looking to, into colleges all that kind of stuff kind of looking into majors picked a major that I of course changed like four times just to kind of help. <laughs> um so I went to high school and actually went to a private school it's called Landmark Christian School went there um they kind of got me set up looking into colleges i picked UGA because I wanted to do dietetics, which is like nutrition hmm. kind of stuff. So, um, and there's only two schools, there's Georgia Southern and UGA. And so I picked UGA and I stayed in state because of the Hope Scholarship. That okay. was the thing my parents said, I could go anywhere as long as it hit the same amount of scholarship that I yes. got from Hope. And they really drilled into us, like you don't want debt, you don't want um, to have to come out of college yeah. with a big pile, like where that's where your income is going to go as soon as you get a job. That's so funny. I picked UGA and ended up changing my major like four times, but it was great and it was the best school um, and I loved it. It was a great experience for me. Okay. So then uh, you said you started off with a dietitian major, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was the, why did you change like so many times and also what were your other majors? Yeah, so I think I only officially changed it twice, but I had a lot of thoughts. Okay. Um, so I got through a year and a half into that, and dietetics is super science heavy, and Okim okay. just was killing me slowly. Um, and I went to, um, I decided, I think there was like one day I just kind of was like, you know what, I don't really care about the science as much as I care about the people, because mm -hmm. I wanted to do dietetics to kind of help people that had diabetes and other kind of um, long-term chronic illnesses. And yeah. I was like, I a lot more about people than I do the science. So um, I started looking and investigating and I wanted to do psychology because I thought that was really interesting and kind of investigated the career paths with that. And it was pretty small as far as a bachelor's degree goes. Afterwards, you really can't do much. Yeah. Um, so I looked into social work because I actually had a friend who was doing that. And that's where I ended up. So I changed to psychology once and then changed to social work again. And just because it was really broad, there was a ton of different opportunities and um, it fit a lot more where it's very people focused and very help driven career. And that's where I wanted to go. Okay. Awesome. So you ended up in a social work uh, major and you graduated with that degree, correct? Yep. Okay, great. So then now what, what happened after college? Did you go straight into social work or did you go into another avenue? Um, I went to work for a campus ministry right afterwards called UGA Wesley Foundation. Okay. So I worked there for a couple of years, kind of did that as more of a, um, I felt like I needed a break. My, mm -hmm. my internship for social work, you always have to do an internship your senior year. It was okay. super heavy. I worked with adults with severe mental illness. And so mm -hmm. I kind of wanted something, a little bit of a break from that. Um, so I did that. I loved it. And then I went straight back into grad school and got my master's. Okay. And when you have your bachelor's in social work, if you get your master's within five years, it's only a year. So, and I actually finished in 10 months. So I like wow. did it really quickly. Um, and that was awesome because you just get it done. And then you can also just get straight into the workforce after getting your master's. Wow. Okay. Awesome. So it sounds like it's 
really beneficial, even cost effective for you to have the undergraduate degree? Because I would assume that there are some classes that you took in undergrad or bat for your bachelor's that were matched or used for your master's, correct? Exactly. So it's kind of, if you don't have your master's, or I mean, if you don't have your bachelor's in social work, you essentially are taking what I took my senior year, your mm. first year as a master's student, because it's two years if you do it, it regularly with any other bachelor's degree. And then for me, it was just one. Okay, awesome. So after college, you uh, entered into uh, a ministry, but then what did you do after um, those? You said it was two years, correct? With part of UGA Wesley? Oh yeah, two years at Wesley and then okay. one year in grad school. One year in grad school. Okay, then after grad school, you have your master's degree. What did you do after that? Yeah, so um, I, I went into, so there's two ways to do a social work master's degree. You can do more of the micro focus, which is more clinical, or the macro focus, which is nonprofit organizations, um, policy, that type of stuff. And I did the macro side because I was a lot more interested in nonprofits. Mm. And I also got a certificate in nonprofit management, so uh, which is basically like a minor, but for masters. Yeah. Um, so I did that, and then I got a job working for a nonprofit that worked for um help them like the homeless and the working poor populations so um, I did that right actually before technically I graduated because I finished in um, yeah so I started working for them and uh, was able to also get my license so okay. when you have your master's in social work kind of the next step as far as like professionalism is um, getting your license and that just enables you to one get a little bit more pay Okay. Um, granted with social work, you're probably never going to get a ton of pay, but <laughs> help to get a little bit more. Right. And, and, um, the first step in that is what we call LMSW. So licensed master social work. Mm. And so that's the first step. And then if you're a more clinical social worker, you can go through and get, um, your LCSW, which is after three years, you get like a thousand hours of clinical supervision. You can get your LCSW and that's kind of social workers that are counselors. That's what they do. So okay. that's kind of, and that's another exam that you have to take. Um, but I just did the LMSW, and that helps with a little bit of professionalism when I'm talking to people and they see the letters beside my name. It kind of helps a little bit. Especially okay, awesome. Bigger, yeah, like <laughs> seriously. Yeah, those are a lot of letters. Mm -hmm. uh, so you were in the social work sphere. How long have you been in, or have you transitioned to another job? Or tell us about it. Yeah, so I worked for that nonprofit for about three years. Okay. Um, so I started in 2017, and then it, towards the end of 2019 and beginning of 2020, I actually had a little bit of a career shift and okay. now work in the trade show industry. So a little Interesting. different. <laughs> okay, so that what warranted that change? Did you just want a complete shift, or you were like, let's do something new, or was it yeah. kind of related? Yeah, I was working for, I mean, that nonprofit, and they were having a little bit of financial struggles, and so I kind of had my radar up as far as maybe I should switch and yeah. that type of thing. And um, I actually had a coworker who um, just kind of passed my name along without me knowing to this, and this, uh, it was her friend who worked for this company called Nth Degree that I work at now. And she um, contacted me and was like, hey, you know, so-and-so talked to me about you, said you were a really good employee. I'd love to chat and see if we can find a spot for you. So it was really just networking and yeah. um, they thought I was a good fit for the job and personality wise for the company. And so then I just started working with trade shows when they, they kind of wow. swooped in and offered me a good position. Yeah. So it really sounds that your work ethic at your previous job and also building the, that community or that, uh, as you said, network mm -hmm. really helps you get another job. And it goes, shows the importance of how you developed as a professional mm -hmm. really led you to these steps and where you're working at today. Absolutely. Um, so tell us about what, before social distancing and COVID-19, what did your jo job look like? Did you travel a lot? Monday through Friday, office? Tell us. So it's a little bit all over the place. So um, depending on what area you kind of work with, with trade shows, there's like some months are busier than others. For me specifically, March and October were the busy months. Um, so typical day, working in the corporate office, there's about 100 people. I'd go in there pretty standard 8.30 to 5 kind of hours doing um, computer stuff and, you know, just very standard. Yeah. Then when trade shows would come into town, um, we would work pretty much you get there at seven and you leave whenever it's done, yeah. 7 a.m. and you leave whenever it's done. So the hours are way longer 
because you're working with the, the labor that's physically coming into build booths and um, we're doing real time um, hourly kind of payroll stuff and um, working on that type of stuff. So the hours are way longer, travel yeah. occasionally if they want me to go to different shows. Um, and, uh, but I didn't travel a, soup, a ton just because okay. I was able to go to the Atlanta shows, but we have um, people that are traveling all the time for our company. Got it. So can you actually even describe what exactly is a trade show? Yeah. Um, so a trade show is when you think about a business that is um, marketing whatever their product is to other businesses or people that can purchase their products. That's kind of what a trade show is. So it's a really big, if you think of like an exhibit hall, like mm. just full of different booths. And that is what a trade show looks like. And um, it's basically just businesses marketing to other businesses. And okay. uh, yeah, that's what it really looks like. Okay. And what was your job specifically? So I'm an account manager. Okay. So I work for, I do everything from like the billing and the payroll to um, working for uh, a lot. I, stand, I work as like a go between, between the customer and what they want the booth to look like. And then the labor, the men and women that are actually building the booth and making sure that everybody's in sync. Got and, it. Um, the people get paid that are actually building, but then the customer gets what they actually really want in the mm. booth. Okay. So now that we are in a world of COVID-19, social distancing, how has your job changed, if any at all? Yeah. So people aren't really able to social distance at a trade show. So yeah. they're um, with it kind of whisperings kind of, started in March um, and then very quickly everything just kind of um, halted mm -hmm. and shows canceled right and left or postponed wow. right and left. So really our income as a company dried up immediately. Wow. So we, the vast majority of us are furloughed right now mm -hmm. um, because of this. We still have some people that work in our event side that are working because they work, you know, up to a year, year and a half in advance on these big events. So they still have stuff to be doing. We really don't because trade shows are not happening. Yeah. So that's kind of what we're doing now. They have plans to bring us back on as soon as things are kind of developing and getting back to normal. Um, yeah. So that is kind of what we're doing now. They're, they've been really great to us in um, making sure that they've been communicative and helping us understand how things are going. Wow. Um, but that's just kind of how we were affected. Wow, that seems like a lot of change mm -hmm. uh, in a very short amount of time and definitely some negative aspects to that. But my question to you now is, what is honestly something that you've been able to see that's positive out of all this change, whether it be like personally, um, job wise, even uh, globally, what's something positive? Yeah. So I've actually seen personal and professional kind of positive things happen with my background in social work, especially with the populations I worked with, with the homeless and people that were, you know, very at risk for homelessness. Yeah. Um, I think people kind of view me as somebody who knows a little bit about that. So I've actually had friends and colleagues and other people actually reach out and ask if there was something that they could do during this time for those populations, which is cool. I like being that resource. I like being able to connect people. And it was encouraging to me um, to see the compassion of people when, mm -hmm. uh, times are hard and they're yeah. still thinking about how they can help people. Yeah. So that's been kind of cool to be that. And I'm still very connected with the nonprofit I worked for. So I'm communicating with them as Got far it. as how we can continue to support people and, you know, figuring out their needs and passing that along to people who are willing to help. Okay. And then personally, I think it's a great time for some personal development. Mm. And, um, I know for my license, I have to have continuing education credits. So I've been knocking some of those out because it's kind of hard to, um, you have to have 35 hours every two years. And so, and that, that comes up this September for us. And that was a cool opportunity. Normally it's very hard to have the time to do that. And so right. now I've been able to get a bunch of those done and learn some really cool things, um, relating to social work. And then also just reading some books, like personal hmm. development books yeah, and yeah. just really focusing on my mantra during this because it's very easy to be discouraged when life looks different, whether that's finances or just routine. 
um, my mantra has just kind of been, I want to come out of this better. How can I be a better person wow. at the end of this than at the beginning? So that's kind of what I've been focused on. I've been really encouraged by the compassion of people and then really um, challenged myself to become a better person professionally and just personally too. Yeah, no, that's amazing to hear. I, and I think you even mentioned it, Al, in this season, it, there's a lot of uncertainty and you even mentioned finances. Uh, it looks a lot different now. So can you tell these students, why is it so important to focus on finances even like during a season like this or even before a season like this? Yeah, I grew up with a dad that nailed in our heads that you had to save, that, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, that, that is just always, when I got an allowance, it was like, here's 10% here's for saving. It's just, that's all we always did it. So it's been like nailed in my head to make sure that I'm saving. And so I'm lucky that I've got a good amount that I am fine during this time got because it. I've been saving since I, when I was in college, I worked at Old Navy. And so I started saving then. Yeah. And so it, I, it's just been really just in my head. My dad said, you know, you need six months of reserve. That's just kind of wow. what you need. And I think that's a realistic point right now for me yes. um, with trade shows not happening anytime soon. I'm really thankful that I have six months in reserve because wow. I'm able to draw on employment, which is great, mm -hmm. but um, that's not as much as I was making. So yeah. it's I'm having to be really careful. And then also um, when you're saving for a rainy day, this is the rainy day that's happening for a while. And nobody could have predicted this. This is hopefully never going to happen again. It's totally not normal, but it's really important to, if you have a, you know, something break in your car and you got to pay for it. That's expensive. There's just things that when life happens, like insurance prescriptions are expensive. Yes. It's just the older you get, the more you realize adulting is kind of a trap and it's just expensive. And so, um, it's, I've been really thankful to have, um, some reserves to be able yeah. to not feel it. And then also with my background in social work, I'm very aware of a lot of resources as far as food, um, health or security more so, um, different type of um, things to help with prescriptions, whatever it is, there, there's a lot of resources out there. And wow. so um, to help families or individuals that are hitting some financial hardships. And so I've been able to kind of navigate those resources and then kind of point people that way too for when times get tough. Wow. So beneficial. And it, I have heard that six month rule. It's, so to say, it's hard because you see that when it's not a rainy day, and you see that lump sum, you're like, oh man, I would really love that blank that is nice and new and shiny, but you have to have that mindset, like, I'm not touching that whatsoever, because mm -hmm. that is going to be for my rainy day. And life shows us that there will always be rainy days. They might be distanced every five years, they might be distanced every five months, but it's mm -hmm. so important to save money and keep it away. Exactly. Awesome. Well, Laura, thank you so much for sharing a little bit more about your background and social work and how it's led you to this new job and kind of what, how you've been navigating uh, during these times and how you haven't stayed still. Like you're constantly learning, like keeping that positive attitude. Um, so thank you so much for sharing this wisdom with students and I uh, really appreciate your time. Yeah, anytime. Happy to help. Awesome. Thank you, Laura. See ya. See ya.